with an intro like that, I feel like I have to do a backflip or something. <laughs> Got to be a little disappointed, it's just me. No, I'm happy to be here with you all today. Um, we're finishing up our series on Jonah this morning. My name's Dane, I'm the worship minister here, if you don't know me. I'm super happy that you guys are here today. You can find our sermon notes, sermon scriptures on the YouVersion Bible app, if you have that. You can find it under events. You can search Discover there. All of our notes, everything there, it's an awesome app, a great resource for us. And if you've been following along in our Jonah series, you can find so many wonderful lessons for free by signing up to our church's Right Now Media account. You can find that on our website. We've been going through the Jonah series alongside of this series uh, with Eric Mason. His videos on there are a great resource, good tool to use, um, and I've been using it a lot through this study. So, how many of you have ever had, like, your anger meter get to the top? and then explode, right? Just, just it builds up in sometimes, and, and, and sometimes it builds up quick, sometimes it takes a little while, but our anger stacks up and it's really limiting for us until we do something that we can't take back, right? And then I was thinking this week, it's kind of like this. If you don't like loud noises, I'm sorry, there's gonna be one. Um, it kind of comes up, it's like this balloon, right? We can get angry at a significant other, right? I know if you have anxiety, I'm so sorry. Um, like a significant other or something they said or done, or maybe you get angry at a politician, right? They said that they would fulfill a promise they didn't surprise. Um, maybe you are in a rush and you hit back to back red lights. There's already a hole, but we're gonna pop it, right? And like Jonah, maybe, you're dealing with anger against someone who's wronged you. You know, the Assyrians, right? The Ninevites, they were not kind people to Jonah's people. Maybe there's anger and jealousy when you look around you and you see God bringing joy and compassion to somebody that you think doesn't deserve it. However, in the end, it pops up and the anger it builds. Close your ears. Maybe, wow. Good morning. Good morning. I hated that. I debated not doing that one. How'd you feel when that balloon popped, right? What's left now is a mess. We've got the balloon, like, everywhere, scattered, right? There's usually something left over when our anger explodes. We're left with a mess, and, and we still may be angry at somebody that maybe God's calling us to love. There's no sustainability in anger, only heartache. It, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up until it has to be released somehow. And so this week, we, we pick up where we left off last week. God, he's addressing Jonah's anger problem with his hardened heart. Jonah, he didn't want God's grace. He didn't want God's grace for those who had hurt his own people. Worst of all, right, those Ninevites. And Jonah directly went against God in the process. And through those circumstances, Jonah, he allowed his heart to be hardened by his anger. We've been talking about that. And so we pick up where we left off, Jonah 4.4. Right? Last week, we were left with this question, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? And so God hears, he's confronting Jonah. He asks him directly, he says, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the ways that I choose to show compassion on those that I love? Is it right for you to be angry about Nineveh? And so how does, God, or how does Jonah answer God's question? He, he does what he does best, and, and I think he ran away, ran away from the question. He ignored it. Instead of reflecting on God's question and acknowledging his own sin, Jonah, he chose to focus on his anger. He focused on Nineveh's sin. And that anger is going to bottle up. And we're going to see how that results today. Jonah 4, 5. It says, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter. And he sat in its shade and he waited to see what would happen to the city. He waited to see what would happen. Jonah, I love this picture because I, I think he went outside the city. I was almost, he was just like setting up a little camp. You know how 4th of July, you like get your little blanket out and you put it on a hillside and you're ready to watch the fireworks? I think that's what Jonah was doing outside that city. He was ready to watch something blow up. He was ready. It's like he didn't actually believe that the Ninevites had listened to God and repented. He's totally hoping for them to fail. Jonah wanted forgiveness for himself and justice for them. He wanted disaster to happen to Nineveh. He was not expecting at all for God's mercy to intervene. And so Jonah's impatient anger, 
It kept him from seeing how God sees us. His impatient anger kept him from seeing how God sees us. See, Jonah blew up and was left over with this mess. He couldn't see how God sees us. And the author of Jonah wanted to make something clear here, that in verse 5, that word see, it has a couple implications for us. See, Jonah would sit on that, that, little, uh, that little picnic blanket, right? And he's, he's waiting to see what would happen to Nineveh. And it's the same Hebrew word used just a few verses later in Jonah 3.10 when God saw what Nineveh had did and how they turned from their evil ways. And so God relented and he did not bring destruction that he threatened. So when God saw, right, he saw Nineveh. And, and there is no bigger contrast between what God saw and what Jonah saw where God looked at the transformation of Nineveh with compassion and joy. Jonah, he saw that grace of God on the city with anger, with anger. And he, and he hoped that they would just return to evil just to justly receive their punishment um, along the way, continuing to fill his soul with anger. And Jonah's anger, it blinded him to the incredible gift of God's grace. And we need to be aware that anger, it can give us this thing called tunnel vision. I'm sure you know what tunnel vision is. We've got a picture up here of a tunnel, right? And living with anger in our lives, it takes this physical, emotional, spiritual toll, and it leaves us missing the beauty of God's grace beyond what we can see. Hate and anger is kind of like that tunnel up here. If only we could just get out of it. We can see what beauty is missing from our lives. And what is it? Right, and I look at that picture and I wonder, man, what kind of mountains are behind that? What other trees, you know, maybe there's a, a new city over there that, that's over the hillside I haven't seen yet. You know, there's a lot of untold scenery behind what blinds us by the tunnel vision. See, God wants the best for us. And hate, it's keeping us from seeing what God intends in our lives. And like Jonah, anger, it can consume our heads, it can consume our emotions, it can consume our thought process, it easily steals joy, and it can remove the ability to find peace in our circumstances. And so today, in your own relationships, before going to a hillside, hoping to watch someone else's life blow up, right? Before hoping bad things on others or destruction for others, take a step back. And allow God to question your anger. You know, I get angry. Ang ang anger's going to happen. It it's just something that we all deal with. We're all human, right? It's an emotion. We all have to confront it. And, and so we ask ourselves, is it right being angry? You know, I think it's okay to be angry, but is it right to be angry? That's the question. And so what is the bigger picture of God's grace that you might be missing because of a tunnel vision caused by anger. We need to set aside our anger to see how God sees us. We set aside our anger to see how God sees others too. Because anger, it gives us this false sense of sight and God, he frees us to see people as he does. And I always come back to this verse in 1 Samuel 16, 7. It says, the Lord doesn't look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's so true. Because Jonah, he chose not to see Nineveh in light of how God, uh, how God sees them. And, and Jonah, he could not get out of that tunnel. And out of his anger, he never considered the hearts that the, the repented uh, Ninevites had. Never considered it. He rejected it. He didn't believe it. And where God saw compassion, Jonah, he was tunnel visioned and blinded by his anger. Proverbs 16, 32, it says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. See, God, he says that there is strength in overcoming an angry heart. That it's more honorable than any strength that calls for a destruction of a city, especially Nineveh. Right? Aligning our spirits with God. God calls us to be slow to anger. And to be slow in anger, it means that we embrace God's patience in our lives that we look to his examples of patience. And one perfect example of God's patience is in his mercy. Good God is patient in his mercy. See, we know God is patient in his mercy towards Nineveh. However, Jonah rejected believing in that mercy. And it's a good thing that God's mercy doesn't depend on Jonah's patience. Because God here, he is patiently showing that very same mercy to Jonah. 
In Jonah 4, 6, it says, Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, and he made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah, he was very happy about the plant. So there Jonah is, right? He made a shelter to camp out, see the fireworks. But God, in his mercy, looked at Jonah's state, and he said, Jonah, that shelter of yours, I think I can provide better. And so God, he was merciful right now to a disobedient prophet. God provided this plant to cover over Jonah to bring him some relief that day. Now here's the picture of what a lot of commentators believe the plant to be. It's called the ricinus plant. You can see how huge it is, one of the leaves, right? Um, it has broad leaves and it, it's known to grow very quickly. And see, I look at that and I'm like, God did what God does best. He is so abundantly merciful to Jonah. You know, if I was to choose that plan, I might have chose something smaller. Um, but even when our hearts right, are hateful, when we're angry, God, he is searching to cover us with mercy and grace. He is searching for that. In our worst selfish conditions, like, like that leaf, God is trying to cover us with mercy. In Jonah, he enjoys God's mercy, and we should too. Jonah, he loves it. It gives him life. God shows mercy despite of me, despite of my angry tunnel vision. Praise God. And now for the first time in the story, we're told Jonah, right? This guy, we've been talking about him. He's very happy. When has that happened so far? You know, he's always had so much to complain about, so much to run from. And yet now we're told Jonah, he is so happy about that plant. And so this week I thought, you know, times of discouragement and grief for better or for worse, whether we're right or wrong, right? Sometimes the small comforts from God, they can be particularly sustaining in our lives. You know, somebody might send you just a little encouraging card this week. And I like to think that that's God covering you in grace. You know, maybe this week you found like an extra hour to lay down, take a little nap, rest. You know, that is God covering you in grace. It's, it's these little things that can remind us of that. Now, for Jonah, I'm sure self-pity was definitely involved and played in a role in how, how such a simple act, a little leafy plant, was something, right, finally going right for him. And I was reminded this week how I'm not much of a good plant caretaker, right? My grandpa's here. He's a farmer. He's not going to like this. Um, I'm not a good plant caretaker. Gaby does a wonderful job. Uh, with our garden at home. I meant to bring one. We have these little tomatoes now, and it's so cool just to know, like, hey, we grew that in our backyard, right? And recently, though, I, I, I neglected this um, sad, withering um, bamboo plant, right? I found it in my office. I'm like, oh, no, I forgot about it. It's now a part of the compost pile, so, you know, give and return. So, anyways, in college, a roommate and I, we also had a little plant by our window, and I felt like I did much better at taking care of that thing. Uh, we watered it. We gave it sunlight. We did pretty good until, obviously, life got busy when you're in college. And watering it happened less and less and less. And weeks had passed, and then we remembered, oh, no, we have a plant that we have to take care of, you know. I think about this when I think about fatherhood. Anyways, um, he's like, I got a plant to take care of. And so... We go, we evaluate that plant. It's a miracle because that plant, it is still green. It's still alive. And I think about the grace of God every time I think about that little plant, how that plant gave us a little glimpse of hope and joy and life whenever I would see it, despite of our times of neglection. See, later that year, we were probably doing something stupid, and it got knocked off of the windowsill, and it broke, it shattered, and, um, you know, there was uh, dirt everywhere. And we pick up that little plant, and that's the day I realized we've been watering a plastic plant all semester. <laughs> a plastic plant. <laughs> See, there was nothing that we could have done to damage or destroy that plant that gave us joy, no matter whether we knew it or not. See, God's grace and mercy, it is something that we can enjoy whether we deserve it or not. Whether it's earned or we did anything to care for it, it's something that he's given us. And Jonah finally came around to recognizing just a glimpse of God's grace and mercy. And, and I always question, why did it take him this long? You know, why did it take just a, a stupid little plant to finally be that thing, right? 
See, God showed so much grace to Jonah, but again, I think that's the problem with tunnel vision. We, we think we know what's on the other side, but we don't really know what we're missing. God showed grace to Jonah a lot, right? We can name them. Sent the storm to redirect his paths. He showed grace and kindness to the sailors, too. You know, he showed grace by sending a fish to swallow him, to keep him alive in the ocean for three days, right? He favored him in ministry. He changed Nineveh, and he saved lives through Jonah. And now, God even shows grace and mercy when questioning Jonah's motivations by providing this little plant. So I think to myself, you know, how have I experienced God's grace and mercy in my life? And I think we can all think that. Maybe you've experienced it through your faith, like, like God's grace pulled you in and, and it didn't require you to clean up, it accepted you as you are. Maybe you've experienced God's grace through your messes. Maybe you messed up, you, you found forgiveness and peace with it. Maybe a person came alongside you to lift you up, to, to give you company during loneliness or, or comfort when you're sick. And maybe you've seen God's grace in action even when things go right. A biopsy comes back negative or, or, or you finally get a job just as your savings runs out. A broken relationship has been restored. Maybe you recognize God's grace in the simple act of just waking up every morning because each day is a gift. See, these are the experiences of grace that are just life-changing to recognize. And it should shape how you see others too. And so do you see others through the lenses of God's grace and his mercy? Do you believe that they deserve it too? Or like Jonah, you know, tunnel-visioned, blinded with anger and resentment, just waiting for something to explode. Jonah deserved judgment. But he was shown mercy a lot. Jonah, having been forgiven, refuses to forgive others. And when he sees that God is showing mercy to sinners, Jonah himself is offended. He didn't mind receiving grace upon grace upon grace. He enjoyed and he loved God's grace, but was tunnel visioned by anger. He was disconnected to the truth that God's grace that he loves to receive is the grace that God offers that God offers that grace to sinful people. Like Nineveh, he offers it to save the lost. And like Jonah, his grace offers an opportunity to produce repentance in the lives of those that he's called. But man, Jonah missed it. He, he witnessed God's repeated mercy with so much to be thankful for. And the only thing that we see him thankful for is the shade from that plant. While he hope, hopelessly, right, anxiously waits for Nineveh's downfall. And so God desires to show his mercy again to Jonah, this time a little different. He desires a teaching moment for Jonah. Because sometimes mercy, it looks a little bit like discipline. See, Jonah 4, 7 to 8, it says, But at the dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Whoa. See, I, I don't think God took away that plant that quick just to be mean to Jonah, but rather to teach him. See, Jonah, he missed the mark, right? That's what sin means. He, he sinned. He missed out on aligning his life to the life that God desired for him. And sometimes when we don't quite get it, God chooses discipline. And there's a difference between discipline and God just being a jerk, right? You know, growing up, you can call your parents a jerk for not letting you play out in the middle of the street. But you know that it's a good thing, Right? Not because you're trying to be mean, but you're trying to do what's best for the kid. And they might not understand until the consequences come, right? That running in the street can be dangerous, right? God's discipline is kind of like that. It's a function of his love. His discipline is a function of his love. It has a purpose for growth. It has a purpose for spiritual maturity and change. It's a means to lead us back to him to remember repentance, to, for the sake of humbling ourselves and walking intimately with our Father. And that little thing that brought Jonah joy as he waits for destruction was taken away. A plant was eaten up by the little worm. Jonah, he had no hope in sight, likely due to the tunnel vision of anger. 
See, God took the plan away so that Jonah could possibly have a chance to open his eyes to his own heart and heart. See, God cares for us, and, and this means that our lives might be disrupted sometimes so that we can turn away from the things that might ultimately destroy us. Because God's discipline has a purpose. And that purpose is this. It's for our hearts to change. And it's for our disposition to change against others. Jonah 4, 9, it says, But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry I wish I were dead. (laughs) It's wild. And when God asked Jonah if it's right he's angry towards sending Nineveh earlier, right? In his hard heart, he said yes. And now God asks um, Jonah, is it right for you to be mad about this little plant that I gifted you? Jonah says yes. He missed the mark again because Jonah, he did nothing to tend to the plant Plant once, it wasn't his, it was God's. And so God stepped in and he's ready to confront Jonah's hypocrisy. You know, Jonah wishes he was dead because of a loss of a comfort from the plant that God mercifully gave him. But he wasn't troubled over the people that God created in his own image. You know, are we more concerned with our own situations that we reject the spiritual and physical needs of others? Jonah 4, 10 to 11, it says, But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant. Though you didn't tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight, it died overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also so many animals? See, God is saying to Jonah, You have more compassion for your own needs being met temporarily than the eternal needs of others that you may not like. In Rediscovering Jonah, Tim Keller, he, he talked about how ancient philosophers, they spoke of this thing called the love of bene- benevolence, the love of benevolence. And this meant doing good and helpful things for people, even if you didn't like them. It's like choosing to hold the door open for a boss that just fired you, or the classic Ohio State fan stopping on the side of the road to change tire from a guy with a license plate that says Ann Arbor on it, right? It's about choice. It's meant uh, performing loving actions even if your heart's not drawn out in affection towards somebody. That's the love of benevolence. And in contrast, there is this thing called the love of attachment in which you love someone because your heart was bound up with them in attraction and loving desire. It's like loving a spouse or a family member or a friend regardless of what they do. And ancient philosophers, they believed that God, he could certainly do loving things, but a God could not have heart attachments to mere human beings. And that is why this is such a big deal. That is why God's language here in Jonah is so shocking because the word that's used for concern in these verses, right, it's also translated compassion. And it's a word that means to grieve over something deeply, to have your heart broken, to weep for it. It's like when somebody so close to you is so sad and the only thing you can do is sit next to them and cry with them. That's the compassion we're talking about. You share the pain and you share in the hurt. And God says to Jonah, Jonah, you had compassion for that plant. You wept over it, Jonah. Your heart became attached to it. And when it died, you cried, you grieved. You wished you yourself were dead. You shared in the pain with that plant. And then God essentially says, You weep over plants, but my compassion is for my people, Jonah. See, God's compassion is for people. It is always for people, and and that is radical for a God. That is the language of attachment. God, he weeps over the evil and the brokenness of Nineveh. The love of attachment, it makes him vulnerable to suffering. And that is what God says about himself here, that he hurts deeply for broken people. He has compassion for them. Jonah, you know, I don't think Jonah decided that he was going to attach his compassion to that plant. I think it happened involuntarily because of his anger. Because of his anger, he was blinded. 
God, however, right, we know he needs nothing, and yet he loves voluntarily. He hurts for Nineveh, he hurts for Jonah, and he hurts for you, and that is his choice. He chose to do that. Man, how often do we wish evil on those who don't have the same set of beliefs, right? Maybe, maybe you don't directly wish evil on someone, right? Because that's kind of harsh, but, but maybe you're just not concerned about them. Maybe you don't care about their problems or, or, or give the time of day to think about others' spiritual or physical needs. Maybe it doesn't bother you at all if somebody else missed what God has in store for them. See, but God, he assigns and he appoints things to us to help us see where our heart is as the church. And so maybe today that is a moment you're going through. Maybe it's a wake-up moment. And maybe, it's not an act, maybe you feel like something's happening to you that might be a punishment, but maybe it's an act of love today. See, when God brings certain circumstances together to help us see our hearts, I think that's an act of love. He does this so we can face our enemies and love them. We can face anyone on earth, no matter the differences, any circumstance, and we can introduce love to the equation. What good is the heart of the church if it has anger just building up inside of it? Someday it'll pop. See, even when our hearts are hateful, God, he is searching to cover us with his mercy and grace for our hearts to change and our disposition to change against others. And that's the story of Jonah. And I believe if it were up to us, we'd never bother showing mercy to our enemies. And yet, yet Jesus, right, stepped in so that his enemies could be restored to a right relationship with God. And that should change our, our view of the word enemies forever, right? Enemies no longer means for us somebody that's on the other side, but it is somebody that you can come alongside and show mercy. And if only Jonah could have confidently just come alongside the Ninevites, you know, with God's love and compassion in his heart. See, the story is not about what Nineveh deserved. You know, likely Jonah was right in thinking that they deserved destruction. But as we're wrapping up the book of Jonah, we know it's a story about God who is merciful and compassionate. God says that these Ninevites didn't know their right hand from their left, and that's an extremely generous way of looking at it. They don't know the first clue to the source of their problems or how to fix them. Now, God, he still did threaten to destroy Nineveh, and so there's no question as to what they did deserve. It is what they deserved. But God showed remarkable sympathy and understanding because he is a compassionate God, slow to anger. And so what is keeping you from compassionately loving others the way that God loves you? There are so many people searching to the answers of the questions. What am I living for? You know, what is the meaning of my life? And on top of that, they don't have much help getting there. You know, you might be one of them. And you see, when, when God sees people in that kind of spiritual fog, he doesn't go, ah, oh, you idiots, right? He doesn't say, ah, serves them right. Doesn't mock them online. He, he doesn't say, look what this imbecile is saying, and then click share, right? He says, no, no. Instead, he has compassion on these people. The sadness of their condition, it is shared by God, and that's the character of God's grace. And it's a character summed up in Romans 5, 7 to 8. It says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you don't hear anything today, hear this. Jonah, he faced his enemies with anger, and he hated them. And Jesus, he faced his enemies, and he died for them. See, the prophet Jonah, he didn't have compassion over the city, but Jesus, right? Jesus, the true prophet, he did. We can look at the last week of Jesus's life. Jesus, he rode into Jerusalem. You know, we read about this most Easter's, right? He rode into Jerusalem, and he knows that he would suffer at the hands of that city, that Jerusalem would be his, be his death, and instead of Jesus making camp outside and, and hoping for God's destruction on Jerusalem, he saw the city as God sees the city. Jesus wept over the city, cried for the city, felt pain for them. He had compassion. 
And on the cross, Jesus, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. In other words, they don't know their right hand from their left. See, here is a perfect heart, generous in mercy, disciplined in love, not condemning. But here is the weeping God that we're reading about in Jonah chapter 4. In human form, this is Jesus Christ. Amen. See, Jesus, he is the prophet that Jonah should have been, and he is much more than that. Jonah went outside of the city hoping for destruction. Jesus went outside of the city to accomplish its salvation. And so today, are you okay with loving your enemies? Take a step back. You know, have, have you ever angered somebody? Odds are you might be on someone's bad side. And, and first of all, that's a relationship that God's calling you to bring compassion to. And second, man, am I glad God loves my enemy's enemies because I might be one. Don't be a follower of Jesus known for what they're against. Be known for what you are for. When you face your enemies, they need to know what you are for. Imagine if Jonah, he went into Nineveh confident in what he was for, not what he was against. Imagine if he didn't miss that mark and how God could have been blessed and, and celebrated with him. See, God is for truth and love. We talk about this a lot here at Discover, that, that truth and love, they're not in conflict with one another, that they are in concert. And I love that. They aren't just harsh towards one another. They harmonize together. Because if you have truth and you don't have love, what you're left with is condemnation. It, it looks like a city being destroyed for what their sins deserve. But truth harmonizes with love. They are together, and it equals compassion. It is forgiveness and understanding. So we need to know what we're for, and I hope that's compassion. See, love doesn't remove truth from the equation. It's not just being nice to people and ignoring the, to tell them the truth about God. See, our job as God followers, as Christ followers, is to make sure that our hearts towards people aren't hateful, that it's balanced with what we're for, that it's balanced with truth and love to make disciples who love Jesus. You see, God's truth and love, they work together in the book of Jonah. God doesn't just allow Jonah to remain undisturbed and angry and broken and stuck in that pattern. No, God, he disciplines. He shows his grace. He sends a storm, a fish, a plant. He challenges him again and again and again. And in the end, he doesn't give up. He asks Jonah the hard questions. Keller said it perfectly. God is both too holy and too loving to either destroy Jonah or to allow Jonah to remain as he is. And God is also too holy and too loving to allow us to remain as we are. That's something, again, you'll also hear a lot here. What's keeping you from loving others the way that God loves you? Today, are you trapped in unforgiveness? You know, maybe, maybe you're not able to forgive someone who's hurt or wronged you. Maybe that person's yourself. Is it bitterness towards somebody? Maybe you don't approve of someone close to you as the lifestyle. Maybe you're upset that, that, hey, God can forgive them too, especially when they're doing that thing, really? You know, is it anger? Is it personal comfort? You know, I'm sure the shady plant's nice and all, but God in his love will interrupt our comfortable places to confront the areas of our lives that need revival. And the book of Jonah ends with God's question to Jonah. It says, should I not have concern for Nineveh? And without an answer, the book ends. Jonah, he doesn't have a recorded response. He doesn't have a recorded heart change. We're not, we're not told what happens. We're left knowing what Jonah was against. That's it. The, the, the author of Jonah, he's so clever. You know? he, while J God is, is asking Jonah this question, it's, it's honestly left for us to answer as if God is asking this question to Jonah, but then Jonah disappears, and we realize, God, he is looking directly at us. So how will you answer today? Where is God calling you to show compassion? Is it right to be angry? Is it right for you to be upset? We'll wrap up. I want to read this verse from Luke seven forty seven. It says, He who has been forgiven deeply loves deeply. See, God, he is for compassion. The highest king is compassionate. He welcomes you. The highest king, he is merciful. He has chosen you. And through Christ, you are forgiven deeply. 
which means that it's time to love deeply. Let's be a church that's for that, right? Let's, let's be a church that's for people who can get that right, right? We can lead with compassion. Let's get the compassion of our God out to the world. Let's pray. God, I am so thankful for your compassion and your grace. Father, where we fail, we know that Jesus has succeeded. God, we're forever grateful for him. We are grateful that you call us yours. We are grateful, God, that, that even though we can be blinded by, by our sin, that we can be blinded by our anger and our lack of compassion, and yet yours does not waver. God, today we recognize that. We praise you for that. And we pray that we can be people who are forgiven deeply, that love deeply. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name.